how has that transition um, worked for you with getting involved more with services procurement and statement of work as well? Just talk me through a little bit about how that's changed over time for you. So I think, you know, um, if I go back to maybe three or four years ago, Johnny, I would have I would have counted services procurement management as a sort of the dark art, the black magic that keeps going on in the background, because it was very well seen as big, you had your big four consultancy spend. And then, as you know, you have this tail of consultancy suppliers. It didn't really touch a lot of the MSP work that we did because I think because of the way that budgets are aligned within a lot of businesses, because of the way it goes up through the PO system, it kind of sits in procurement, multiple different business lines. And people hadn't really got to the point of augmenting the spend. It was almost easier to see that you've got 20 traditional contingent workers in your department versus who's coming in and doing consultancy work. And then, you know, it was only really, I think, you know, as companies started as, as companies started to get on with the body shopping that was occurring, you know, you're in there as a consultant till, or a contract, contractor till Friday and you're, you're 400, 500 pound a day. And then all of a sudden you're being billed at a thousand pound a day because you're coming through an external provider and you're doing some of their work as effectively a, a worker through that consultancy program. So I think it, the kind of, as businesses started to become more interested in it, it became more important that, that from a service provider business, you kind of got involved with it. And I'll be honest, Johnny, this, this to learn about this stuff, it's it, you have to be in there. You have to spend time with procurement people to understand what it is they're trying to achieve. You've got to spend some time with the project managers, the IT project managers, the business change project managers, those people who are driving those transformation programs and understand how they're going about getting their need. And then, you know, there's an education program as well. And I, I find a lot of it was initially self-taught through interest. Like, how does this work? I'm quite an inquisitive person, anyway, quite curious so I kind of like to get into the detail of how it works. And then it was understanding where the, between direct award and mini competitions and how the statements of work are created and how the how people come in under various different terms and conditions, and then who's making the decisions and where it sticks. And actually, it kind of my knowledge is kind of built over time, really, for it and, and through work with, with tech providers such as yourself and other people and, and work through those sorts of things. And I've, I think it's. I think it's the future of holistic workforce management. And it goes back to that point right at the start. I'm a big believer in the work, not the worker. So we need to start looking at what does our business need to achieve? What is our strategy? And then how are we going to achieve that from the workforce? And because of that, it's kind of said to me, right, uh, Pete, you need to get your head around statement of work, services, procurement management, and at least be able to have a, a competent conversation with somebody when it comes to, hey, I've got this problem. How can you do something about it? So, yeah. It's probably because I'm a bit of a nerd, Johnny, and um, <laughs> I've too much time in this um, this environment. Yeah, like you say, you know, curiosity goes a long way, um, and and understanding the mechanics of how something works. And I think with um, with statement of work, just that you know, that if you break it down to the simplest level of I'll pay you X to do Y, mm. it can seem quite simple. But when you peel back the layers, it's obviously very complex. There's a huge amount of, of variation, but it has it has massively increased in importance. And I think. You know, it's always been important to procurement teams. Um, mm. I mean, I've had interesting conversations. I had a, a conversation yesterday with a, um, a very interesting procurement lady who was talking about starting in services procurement um, back in the day before services procurement was kind of really even a thing. Mm. Um, and, and it wasn't really recognised as, as having particularly different requirements to the way that goods and materials were managed, where it is. It's, it's hugely nuanced and complica complicated in, in, uh, in ways that buying goods and materials aren't. And I think there's also been a confluence of contingent workforce and statement of work or services procurement. I mean, if you look, even if you just look at RFPs, mm -hmm. just the increase in the in SOW being a fundamental part of large organizations, contingent workforce, MSP, um, you know, RFPs. Um, also some of the research going on in the market at the moment is really kind of bringing the two together. Clearly they are very different by their very nature, but there's also this kind of crossover, this gray area. Um, where you get this kind of confluence of hourly or daily based work, time and materials crossing over with deliverables based and combinations and things like that. So I think it's very interesting. But when we were talking about the kind of skills audit side of things, and obviously that's primarily looking at an organization's permanent workforce, mm -hmm. but how, how can an organization factor, factor contractors into that? But, but added to that, 
how can an organization factor in their wider services supply chain? Because effectively that is their extended workforce as well. Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. You make a good point about that sort of services procurement management before it became a thing and the difference between sort of goods and products and that sort of services and, and specifically within human capital. I mean, my 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 wife, I mentioned the term human capital, hates it because she said it sounds very like, you know, it doesn't sound very good, does it, when you're talking about people in that way. But I suppose that kind of nuanced piece of services procurement management as we started to realize that goods and service versus as outcome delivery stuff was was different and required a different skill set and a different touch in terms of in terms of skills for the contingent workforce really i think it, for me it, it's there's a couple of bits there really so there's a history of a lot of long-term contractors within businesses and you often find that the role that people came in to do isn't the role that they're doing now that's one of the things, you know, we've we've all seen 10 years north of five years in quite a lot of companies. Um, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> well, say that, but there'll still be very variations of a theme. As we, as we all know, there'll be variations of a theme because where there's a rule, there's a way to get around the rule in a lot of places. Um, but the one thing that did flag to me, and I was having this conversation with somebody, is actually skill fate within the contingent population. So, if you had a certain amount of skills within a permanent employee organization, generally there is some sort of learning and development function, which is starting to upskill and train up employees. And actually for some of the contingent workers, because of the length of tenure and because maybe of trying to avoid IR35 rules in the same way as we view the canteen or the Christmas staff party, it was a kind of, you know, the L&D function, we can't give them access to L&D because then that opens a whole new kind of worms. And, started to make me wonder whether there's actually quite a large population of contractors there that do have skill fit, aren't potentially upskilling as quickly as possible. And when you look at the amount of perm conversions through the IR35, either FTC or permanent headcount, you know, for some of those people, it will be because they needed access to the learning and development, because they needed to upskill, because actually when they dip their toe back out on the contractor consultancy marketplace again, their skills weren't as current and competent potentially as they needed to be, depending on the organization they'd actually been working for for the last X amount of time. So I think it's important to understand how we validate those skills coming in. But I suppose for me, it comes back to the work again, Johnny. It's like, you know, you're buying in the skill set, you're buying in the work. And it goes to actually what we need is visibility and control, which a lot of people have across their MSP backgrounds at the minute. They understand who's coming in and what they're coming in to do. But we don't have as clear a control over that, over services procurement and the people coming through with, you know, those um, various different service providers, what those service providers are coming for, what is their niche skill set? And it's very often that you see that a, a project manager has used, I don't know, Johnny Dunning consultancy to deliver a project and then he needs another project on and then, or one of, one of his or her colleagues needs another project on and they, Say, oh, give Johnny, get Johnny, and he's he's good for doing that. And actually, it's a completely it's a different skill set or a different side of thing. It may be a partner or similar area of the business, but you're not the expertise in that specific area. But because you're known to the business, you come in to do it, and you might do the job, but it might take you twice as long. There's a few um, a few changes there that go along the way in terms of your scope um, or your deliverables. You know, there's change requests that procurement always love coming to see, coming to the system. Uh, or it may just not to be done to the same standard. But, and again, because we could be under a time and materials SOW, which is always an interesting one for me, rather than fixed price or deliverables based, um, it goes under the problem. So a long way of answering, I think we're pretty good at that with contingent because of the type of work that we bring in. We absolutely need to be understanding our suppliers coming into our business and what their specific niche skill sets are and then using them in the right way and making sure there isn't that cross-pollination or the bleeding edge of skills into a different area of the business.